Who would imagine uh, us spending a Sunday afternoon, a free Sunday afternoon, talking about copyright law? When I was a student 20 years ago, uh, studying copyright law with uh, Herman Cohen Johoram, who's actually also uh, in the audience, I would never have imagined this would, uh, this would happen. But since the advent of the internet, of course, much has changed uh, in relation to copyright uh, law. The law that was designed to foster creativity now seems to stifle technology, creativity, and in some instances suppress freedom of speech and enclose the public domain. We have two very esteemed copyright scholars from the United States over today and uh, those of you in the audience who do not know who they are and I've been asked to be brief about introductions uh, so think about having on the stage Lionel Messi and Cristiano Ronaldo <laughs> that's basically the setting and if you don't know soccer I'm not sure what you're doing here but anyway <laughs> But that's basically what we have on stage here tonight. I'm extremely honored to be um, the humble moderating, uh, moderator today. Um, Tracy already said where uh, both law professors actually uh, work. Uh, these are two of their books, uh, Copyright Highway, written in 1995, and The Public Domain by Jamie Boyle. Uh, I really recommend you to read them uh, and of course both are actually uh, also novelists uh, so that's also uh, something to consider. Um, after the structure of the talks is as follows, after uh, Paul Goldstein will give a presentation, James Boyle uh, will follow and then we'll have an exchange of questions and answers and then we will be joined uh, by Bernd Jugendholz, uh, the director of the Institute for Information Law here at the University of, of Amsterdam and in, uh, in football or soccer terms, uh, the Robin van Persie of the Netherlands. <laughs> So I'm, I'm very happy that he will be joining us uh, also and he'll be giving uh, the European or Dutch uh, perspective uh, in relation to the talks uh, presented before us. So Paul, if I may invite you to the stage. Thanks very much, Christian. Uh, thank you all for being here on a Sunday afternoon to, to, talk, to, talk about, to talk about copyright. I'm very grateful to the John Adams Institute, to Tracy Metz, uh, to Martin Van Essen for organizing uh, this, this event, uh, to Walters Kluwer, to, to Google Netherlands for uh, supporting it along with the Institute's uh, regular, uh, regular supporters. And again, thank you. Uh, for, for being here. The discussion is billed as one about copyright and it seems appropriate for me to frame my brief remarks, my brief introductory remarks around copyright. Number one, just to bring us all onto the same page, what is the purpose of copyright law? What purpose does it, does it serve? Uh, and second, how does copyright fit into the battle, the internet battles that are ongoing today and that may very well have drawn uh, some of you, if not all of you, uh, here? Uh, the notion, perhaps, as Christian has already set the terms for debate, that copyright by some is perceived as suppressing uh, certain speech interests. Well, let's take a look, uh, as I propose to do, uh, at what copyright in fact means on, on the internet. To start, what is the purpose of copyright law? Historically, for 300 years, what has the purpose of copyright law been? Copyright law, quite simply, is an intensely practical, pragmatic tool for organizing markets for information and entertainment. It organizes markets by enabling the authors and other producers of creative product, literary and artistic works, by enabling them to capture revenues attributable to the works they, they create, and thus to create more works. It serves an incentive to producers. What does it do for consumers? It ensures a steady flow of new creative product for consumers, and more specifically, the kind of products they want. 
copyright being a property right, enables prices to be charged for access to works. Consumers vote with their euros or dollars or pesos. This is the kind of work I want. They send that message to authors and creators. They know this is the kind of work to produce if you want to be repaid. This is the kind of work that is just not going to sell. Don't bother to do it. The price mechanism is the vehicle that mediates between consumers and producers. And if you look at the 300 year history of copyright, it started by an approximate measure in 1710 uh, in, in England. 300 years of history of copyright have not revealed any system that is superior to copyright in organizing markets for literary and artistic works for entertainment and information. That's the baseline. Now, where does this all fit into the internet? The history of copyright over the past century, the past 100 years, tells us that the battles we see over the internet, over copyright on the internet today, are nothing new. The basic message is this has all happened before. It has happened repeatedly and episodically before. Go to the turn of the 20th century, the early 1900s, and what do you hear? You hear music publishers crying, this is the death of music. This is the death of the market for music because record manufacturers are going to take our music, put it on records, and not pay for it. What happened 20 years later? You heard music publishers who had already made their deals with the record dealers, of course, that, the record producers, that was a great new market for them, saying, well, radio is carrying our music and they're not going to pay for it. That is going to be the end of production. And you'll hear radio stations in the same terms you hear today saying, if they shut us down, if they impose copyright on us, there are not going to be any more radio stations. They're going to still shut down this new technology. You heard the same thing from the motion picture studios when television arrived. They tried to shut down television. When cable television arrived to send their content out even more broadly, you heard from them once again. When video cassette recorders, now DVRs, were introduced into the home to copy off the air, this is going to be the end of copyright. Or if you impose copyright, it's going to be the end of television, cable television, and VCRs. Well, neither copyright nor new technologies have stilled. Each of these battles is very much in its contours like the battle we see today over the internet. And what happens after the dust and the smoke clears from the battlefield is you see what everybody knew was going to happen at the beginning. You see music publishers entering into licenses with record producers, music publishers entering into licenses with radio stations, motion picture studios, licenses with television, cable television, and VCR manufacturers in a somewhat different, uh, in a somewhat different way. What the battles were about, and what the battles are about today, are the terms of trade the terms under which copyright owners will license to these fabulous new media for expanding their markets. That's what records were, that's what the internet is today, and there's nothing more powerful than the internet as a distribution mechanism for getting content into the hands of consumers. It's a fabulous technology. And what we see happening is the resolution of the battle in the same terms, to be specific. You hear the same noises. Copyright is going to die. Literary, artistic production is going to die. Well, the alternative is shutting down the internet. We can't have that. But neither of them is going to happen. What's happened is, look at the internet. Uh, we have licensed arrangements from very early on. iTunes uh, replaced Napster, effectively, as a paid system for getting music into the hands of consumers and the ears of consumers, money into the hands of producers. Uh, Netflix getting motion pictures, television shows, uh, Spotify, Pandora. You can just multiply the number of licensed services that are bringing copyrighted content to markets they never reached before at more, on more reasonable terms than have ever been realized before. What would you rather do, pay 
I don't know what it is in Europe, you know, $15 uh, for a CD that has most of the works on the CD you don't want to hear, they're, they're of no use to you, or do you want a 99 cent download from iTunes from exactly what you want? That's the genius of the internet. And copyright licensing has enabled that. Google? Google is one of the great licensees, players on the internet. Uh, YouTube is much maligned historically by copyright owners. There's a lawsuit by a major conglomerate, entertainment conglomerate against Google. That was really the only conglomerate that was left suing Google. YouTube now has something called Content ID that enables copyright owners to make money when their compositions appear on YouTube or to take it off. They have the choice and that is what copyright always gives. The last point there is, well, what about piracy on the internet? And I'm not talking about Google or iTunes. I'm talking about real pirates. The alliance between copyright owners and their distribution arm, which is what Google is, which is what Netflix is, which is what iTunes is, is so powerful. They are economically joined at the hip. It is so powerful that content owners today can rely on the most effective means for shutting down piracy, which is Google and other internet service providers who have the technology to do it, have the relationships to do it. And again, we see Google doing precisely that, shutting down payment mechanisms, acting as allies. It's in Google's best interest as it is in the interest of every internet service provider to align with copyright owners in expanding markets and having rights respected. Now, this is all then a very rosy picture that I offer about this battle being resolved in the same term that all the battles over the course of the 20th century between copyright and new technologies have been resolved. I would add as a last point, and perhaps Christian, you'll let us return to it in the discussion, as much of an optimist as I am about the resolution of these commercial arrangements on the internet, they are only about commerce. All that I have said relates only to commerce in entertainment goods on the internet. As optimistic as I am about that, I am deeply pessimistic about what the current condition of copyright on the internet means for authorship. You look at the internet and you measure what you can count, and what you can count are the, quant the quantity of works that are disseminated to consumers, which is a concern, and that quantity is still there. It's grown thanks to the internet. I'm concerned specifically about the quality of works. As copyright is degraded by some of the compromises that courts and legislatures have found necessary in their view to accommodate copyright to the internet, as copyright is degraded, so the interests of authors are degraded. Authorial autonomy is dissipated. The quality of works declines. A matter that should be of particular resonance in the European continent where copyright is really not the founding tradition. It is author's right. All that I've talked about in a commercial sense originates in the notion of the author's rights with respect to her work. When I see that degraded, as it is much more in the United States than it is outside the United States, I do worry about the condition of authors. I worry about the quality of works. Thank you very much. Then I would like to ask for the stage James Jamie Boyle who share his views on the current copyright debate. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, after having been compared to either Messi or Ronaldo, I thought it was particularly important that I not fall flat on my face while I climbed up uh, here. 
Um, thank you very much to the John Adams Institute, to Google, Walters Kluwer, and all the other sponsors. Um, it's a delight to be uh, here in Amsterdam, a city I love. It's also a delight to be in this company. Uh, we've had so many analogies to who the speakers are. I'm going to add my own. Uh, Bernd uh, Hugenholz, who you'll see in a moment, Paul Goldstein, um, have long been the, uh, the Sinterklaas of uh, European and American copyright, respectively, uh, bestowing their intellectual gifts on the enlightened and the unenlightened alike. I am merely a, a pale version of Sinterklaas's accompanying flotilla. Um, so I'm going to speak about the about three arbitrarily constructed ages of copyright. The first from about 1950 to the rise of the World Wide Web. The second, the internet age to date. And the third, the future. In each I will claim that we have made wise decisions and foolish mistakes. We should learn from both of those um, as we think about the future. So the pre-digital age, I have to explain this to my students in some detail since they don't actually believe it existed. Um, there's much to respect here in both the US and the EU, and I'll echo some of Paul's comments here. We start with a system that is designed to leave the construction of culture to the people, not to choices made by the state. If I have a novel inside of me, or a song, a searing documentary, I'm allowed to, copyright gives me rights to decide whether to publish it, when to publish it, and gives me some rights to control its content and allows me to make deals with the distribution network. This decentralizes our cultural choices. No state commissar will decree, we must have more boy bands, uh, or set out a quota for sonnets to be delivered in every year. To be sure, and again I'll echo a little bit of Paul, don't worry, we'll start disagreeing in a moment, we may have some doubts about the wisdom of some of those decentralized cultural choices. Um, I'm actually sorry to tell you that a recent empirical study has shown that Justin Bieber does exist. Um, this should cause us a moment of humility, but the system gives creators both respect and a set of entitlements that recognize their contributions to our culture, provides incentive for the future. So far, so good. Second, the system has gaps and limitations. It's not absolute. Facts and ideas go immediately into the public domain. When I write my book, which by the way you can download for free on the internet with my publisher's willing uh, agreement, I'm sure Walters Kluwer is going to follow in that tradition soon. Um, <laughs> When you download my book, the facts and ideas you get out of it are immediately free for all. I don't control them at all. My creative expression, yes, not the facts I use to illustrate my points or the ideas I give you. That's a wonderful way to reconcile freedom of speech on the one hand with the rewarding of expression on the other. Those were the good parts. But some also tragic choices made. Um, when the first when this first internet age began, in some parts of the world, including the United States, one actually had to ask to get a copyright. You had to say, I want a copyright. You might have to engage in formalities, writing James Boyle, copyright, 2013. You might have to register a copyright. What that meant was that 99% of all cultural works produced, the informal world of culture, the um, the poems written for Sinterklaas, the, the uh, home movies or pictures that you make, those were not in copyrights regime. They weren't supposed to be. They were the realm of informal culture, folk culture. They didn't belong in copyrights domain, we thought. In addition, in some parts of the world, <laughs> also the US, the copyright term was shorter and you had to renew it. You got, in the United States, 28 years. And at the end of the 28, you actually had to say, I want another 28. 85% of copyright owners did not renew, and those of you who are authors and publishers will know why, the value of works de depreciates very, very rapidly. Most copyright works ex uh, exhaust their entire value in the first five to 10 years. Uh, 28 years was more than enough. All of those works, both the informal culture and the non-renewed stuff, went immediately into the public domain, and that's a very rich part of creativity, um, one that I would stress a little bit um, more than Paul. This is the loam, the rich soil out of which future works develop. It is the realm of all of those things not controlled by intellectual property, as much a part of the braided rope of copyright as the rights themselves. So what happened? Well, following Europe, the United States flipped both of those choices. You didn't have to ask for a copyright anymore. That meant that every 
piece of creative expression went into copyright. It was sucked into copyright, whether you wanted it to or not. Now, in the pre-digital age, that didn't matter much because the poem was sitting in your sock drawer or your home movie of what life was like in Amsterdam in the 1980s was unlikely to be of accessible to anyone. The internet would change that. All of our informal culture went off limits. So you want to use a home movie of life in the segregated South to illustrate your documentary? Well, good luck, because where's the copyright owner? You don't know. It's an orphan work. You can't get access to it, and you can't clear it. And the contents of our great libraries, crammed full of commercially unavailable works, many of them, in some cases, in some of our works, most of them orphan works, all of those will become inaccessible to the digitization that is about to become possible. The possibility of the global library of Alexandria that at least includes the stuff not being commercially exploited is, if not made impossible, there are efforts which have some promise, made enormously harder. Librarians call this the 20th century black hole. And let me be very clear, it's copyright law's fault. Okay, And this is one where this lovely balance, which Paul describes, came out with, the, to be honest, our collective culture on the short end. We gave a very, very few authors a small benefit and cut ourselves off from most of the culture of the 20th century in the technology it was about to arrive. Bad choice. Also, it's worth mentioning that during this period, other types of regulation actually started turning towards evidence. So if you wanted to make environmental policy, you'd say, well, which is the best way of stopping pollution? Should we have a coal tax or cap and trade or firm em emissions limits? And we actually look at the evidence. Or does this drug work? Let's find out. Let's go and do tests. Copyright law remains stubbornly immune to this tendency. It is, is almost, was almost perfectly an evidence-free zone. We had celebrity anecdotes, lawyers' technicalities, but actual well, you said if we extended the copyright term, there'd be more works. Is that true? No, we didn't do that. Overall grade, pre-digital age, B minus. Excellent idea. Love the idea of decentralizing culture. Believe in protecting authors. I am one. Uh, I have a very warm, almost romantic uh, relationship with my royalty checks. I find them deep and meaningful, like a sonnet. Um, I'm not a foe of copyright, but the side effects, poorly considered, and the lack of evidence, reprehensible. Enter the World Wide Web, age number two. This was invented in 1992 with amazing speed. Only four years later, we were laying the ground rules for it. And you will be shocked how very close, really very, very close, we came to making the World Wide Web impossible, illegal. Content companies saw the potential of the web, as with previous technologies that Paul mentioned, as largely a threat. And they were half right. The web would usher in illicit copying on a dramatic scale. And let me say that I am against this for two reasons. First of all, it's illegal. And secondly, it causes overreactions which tend, in my view, to threaten the technology of the greatest mechanism of free speech ever invented. The risk is that in, in the attempt to cut down on illicit copying, bad, Okay, we will destroy the technology which gives us access to the world. Good. Okay, I want to be really clear what my position on that is. So content companies' view was the web lowers the cost of copying. The answer is, therefore, the rights need to get stronger. And when you get to costless copying, then the rights need to be almost perfect. So they realized early on that conventional policing wouldn't work. The state is too clumsy. It's thick leviathan fingers, too, too uh, unwieldy to actually police these fleeting digital contacts. Instead, they had a brilliant idea. Let's make all the intermediaries liable. Because copying is what's called a strict liability system. It doesn't matter whether you meant to do it. If you copy, you should be liable. And guess what? The internet is one giant copying machine. Vodafone, Orange, thousands, millions of copies flow through their systems all the time. Google copies the entire web every day. It must in order to index it. YouTube, Facebook. The idea was, you're strictly liable. Whether or not you knew this was illicit, Google, you indexed it. Whether or not you knew it, Vodafone, it flowed over your system. Take it down, and if you can't take it down, we'll just sue you, and you'll pay us, and you figure out how to police them. Maybe you snoop on them, maybe you throttle them. You, you do you. So this was a brilliant plan. It had one minor downside. It would make the web completely impossible. Uh, both impossible and illegal. My students' vision of this is, well, that would make Google illegal. We wouldn't have the web today. 
And actually, I think that's a very deep point because I think that there was a substantial risk. We came very close, in my view, to making the wrong decisions there. And message for the future, let's not make a mistake like that. This was a very close run thing. Second thing that happened was you became the subjects of copyright law. All of you sitting out there, not just the publishers, but the people. Copyright law used to be very hard for individuals to trigger. I mean, you could write a book, but if you were going to infringe it, how did you do it? 1950, quick, violate copyright. What are you going to do? Get a cyclo-style machine? You know, maybe one of those nifty gramophones? No. In the old days, copyright law affected people with broadcasting towers and movie studios and printing presses. Great. It really was hard for you to violate it. Today, it's hardly a single citizen who doesn't create copies, transient copies, make versions. We are all in copyright's domain, and it wasn't designed for us. We understand it poorly, and in many ways, it impedes our creators because they don't understand how they're protected, and I want them to understand better. Copyright needs to think about that. So very briefly, the future, since it hasn't happened yet, I'm not going to spend an enormous amount of time on it. I'm going to tell you what my wish list would be. First, copyright law should be made more democratically. Right now, it's very much an insider kind of world. Um, representatives of content companies have very legitimate views, and I support their right to push those views forward. Sometimes they seem to be the only ones heard. Second, we should make it on the basis of actual evidence. If you claim you need a new right, tell me what it's going to get. What result will we have? And then let's do a post-passage action review to see if it worked. Europe did that with a database right. They went, the EU went back and studied it afterwards and said it was a total failure. Okay? And you still have it, by the way. Uh, they didn't get rid of it. They just kept it. Third, copyright's supposed to be about providing access to our culture, but some of copyright side effects, think of the 20th century black hole, have done exactly the reverse. Copyright has acted as fence when it was supposed to be acting as open gate. Copyright, fourth, should not destroy the technologies of global communication. Some of the things which have been proposed, new to deal with illicit copying, DNS blocking, those kinds of things, do threaten those. And finally, copyright should be made comprehensible for human beings. There are lots of ways of doing this. It should be made simpler. There may be special rules for non-commercial activity, which we actually carve out a special realm for. Um, I will finish with one, uh, in my view, tragic story. Um, uh, I've written a lot of things, but the, uh, the thing that has been most read by about a, a million people is a comic book in which Jennifer Jenkins, my co-author, and I explained the law of American fair use. Why was it uh, read a million times? Well, of course, because we're brilliant writers, but uh, the actual reason, people were just didn't understand copyright law, and they wanted to know it, and we should not have to rely on the dubious authorial brilliance of Ameri as law professors, as comic book writers, to achieve that. Thank you very much. So interestingly, the, the, the both of you look at copyright law historically, taking a historical point of view, but reach entirely different uh, solutions. Uh, Paul, on the one hand, uh, seems to suggest that um, the current stage is merely an interim uh, in which uh, gradually commerce will flourish again, like it did in the old days, whereas Jamie Boyle is arguing that uh, things are deteriorating very, very rapidly indeed, and that a drastic overhaul is needed in, um, in some way. Um, an issue you, 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 you addressed, um, uh, Jamie, in, uh, in your last instance, you said people don't understand copyright law. And um, well, for, for many years, people didn't need to understand copyright law because it was something that was dealt with over their heads and nobody really bothered about copyright law. It was organized commercially. Uh, nowadays, uh, consumers are very much involved in the copying itself. And I used to work for, for a company that offered peer-to-peer -peer technology and uh, was called Kaza. And their, their BV, their Dutch limited liability company, was called consumer empowerment. And that is very much what, what happened in the internet age. Now, Paul, is it, doesn't, doesn't the fact that consumers are em empowered, doesn't that make things different now with the internet? It makes it different 
in, in some respects. First of all, if consumers were not face to face with copyright in a way they never have been before, most of you wouldn't be here this afternoon and we wouldn't be having this conversation. I think that's why we're, uh, that's why we're here. It presents an intensely difficult problem uh, that the brilliance of, of Jamie's comic book is this. We need to educate consumers about copyright. But the education is extraordinarily tricky. There is probably not a one of you here who would walk across a neighbor's yard without permission. The norm of trespass, the norm of not invading somebody else's property is in your DNA. This is why you don't do it, why we don't do this, other than in an emergency. Why is that moral intuition that we have, why don't we apply it when it comes to copyright? Because all of you, like me, will download, yeah, with not a second thought. I'll have a second thought uh, because I have some clients who encourage me to have second thoughts about that. But by and large, we will do that. And the difference is that if I intrude on somebody else's land, I'm invading that person's privacy, property. That's just the moral intuition that I have. By contrast, if I copy someone's song, if I download it, who's harmed? The appearance is that no one is harmed. I have the song, but everybody else can use it. We call, economists call information a public good for that reason. Anyone can use it as much as they want without interfering with anyone else's use. So our moral intuition is different. I don't think that moral intuition is going to change no matter how creative your comic books are, and they are extraordinarily creative. I just don't think that's gonna happen. It's just too deep-rooted. What I would do is ignore it and, as a commercial matter, focus on the mechanisms for getting payments for commercial uses into the hands, you know, through internet service providers, into the hands of producers. I think copyright owners make a mistake, and Jimmy touch, uh, Jamie touched on this, and I agree, in overreacting and trying to go after every last individual user of copyrighted works. All that does is create a bad odor around copyright, create disaffection from the principle, the general principle of copyright that commercial uses are basically <coughs> what the system uh, thrives on. Are, are, are you actually su suggesting, Paul, to make a distinction between commercial copyright and non-commercial copyright? No. no, I would definitely not do that. Uh, I'm talking about the commercial channels. Suggestions have been made by responsible people that private uses of copyrighted works should be exempt. In Jamie's pre-digital world, that made sense. And we have private copying exceptions, not in the US, but in Europe, there are many private copying exceptions which make perfect good sense in a, in a pre-digital world. In the digital world of the, the so-called celestial jukebox, the great volume of uses of copyrighted works are gonna be not in a movie theater, not in a concert hall, but in the privacy of your home to exempt those uses because they are private will be effectively to eviscerate, to undermine the economics of copyright generally. There still will be some public uses, but a private use exception in a digital world is a prescription for disaster. Is this something you agree with? Um, unfortunately, I agree with Paul on several points here, but I, but I will attempt to conceal that in my response. Um, uh, so first of all, I agree with him 100%, and the empirical evidence backs this up, that the, uh, the most and frequently the only effective way of cutting down on illicit copying is making um, the legal availability of copyrighted works at reasonable, i.e. lower, prices for widely available. That's the only thing that actually cuts into it. Um, that was the one thing I did, helped with a review of the British copyright system done by the, the Hargreaves Review. The one thing that I failed to get into that final draft was this point, which is we actually know what works, and it's not uh, these vicious enforcement mechanisms. It's you know in making it easier, cutting transaction costs, making licensing simpler, making all of this stuff work. So I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I also find it troubling when law and morals diverge so thoroughly. Um, it's very interesting to me that my colleagues at Duke, um, all of whom, like me, sometimes blithely ignore the speeding laws, would 
do anything rather than to park in a disabled access handicap space. They just won't do it. Because the first is perceived as, eh, there's nobody on the road, it's fine. And the second is perceived as, that's morally wrong. I find it troubling when an entire generation of our youth basically feel all of copyright is, can be ignored. Um, and so I agree with you in terms of moral trouble. We may disagree with some of the solutions, but I, I agree with that. Um, I guess my, the, where, the place where I would disagree is we actually have a model for getting these things right in the past. In all of the examples Paul touched on so beautifully, um, uh, radio, uh, the original wax cylinders and phonograph records, uh, jukeboxes, etc. And the period was that there was a period of creative ferment with the rights not yet settled for some period of time, 5, 10, 15 years. And then, as he said, we argue about how the pie gets split up, but we don't try and fix it all at the very beginning. I fear that in the internet age, we make that mistake, which is we think we understand the world that will come into being and try and legislate it right at the get-go, or even technologically make it infeasible. So that's the mistake that I think we need to avoid here. A little chaos here is frankly not the worst possibility, because out of chaos comes opportunity. So we're currently in a state of chaos, and uh, at some point in time, we'll be fine again. So, if, if, if Paul, Paul, Paul you've, you, you very much indicated that um, uh, copyright works as an order mechanism uh, for commercial uses of uh, books, films, and movies. Um, and I, I, I was very much triggered uh, by uh, by the title of your book, Copyrights Highway, and, and especially the, the subtitle, um, The Law and lore of copyright from Gothenburg to the Celestial Jukebox. Now, mind you, this was written in 1995. So Spotify wasn't around the corner yet, and yet you predicted that the internet was, in fact, a Celestial Jukebox. And both of you have actually mentioned, called it that uh, previously. Why did it take 15 years for Spotify to actually become a Celestial Jukebox? Well, the, it's easy for a, a law professor to sit back in his office and speculate on the logic of the economics of the copyright system and where that would lead in a digital, uh, a digital age. Uh, there's a joke in the United States that uh, our then Vice President Al Gore was present at the creation of the Internet. I actually was. I, I worked on a project uh, with Vince Cerf and others uh, on turning the ARPANET, the government uh, network, into uh, the internet. So I had the taste of that. But to get from the concept of the internet uh, to the reality of Spotify or iTunes takes writing a lot of code, uh, making technological leaps. There was, wasn't just one discipline that required leaps. There were lots of disciplines. Artificial intelligence was at a very rudimentary stage. It still is, but it's much less rudimentary now uh, than, it, than it was then. Uh, there are Google algorithms that people could not conceive of at that point that are essential to the, to the running of the internet. So there's an awful lot of engineering uh, that needs to be done. So it's, it's really wonderful to sit back and say, this is what's going to happen. Uh, and then you go out and write the software uh, that will do it. It's taken a lot of time to write software. James? I think all of that is true. I do think uh, lawyers have to take some, some of the responsibility too. I mean, generally the way we've solved things in the past is we invent a new right when a new technology comes along and we hand it over to someone, frequently multiple someones. So, oh, we'll have a recording right, you know, and then, oh, okay, well, we'll have a, a digital download. Oh, we'll have a, a reproduction right. We, we invent all these rights and we vest them in lots and lots and lots of entities. And in, the, in, in the, both the US and in the EU, particularly in the EU, we tend to attach collecting societies to those rights. And the collecting Collecting society's interest is not in simplification. It is not in harmonization. It is not in everything running super smoothly. They like their little right and they administer it, some with great fidelity to the artists uh, who they represent, some with lesser degrees of fidelity. Generally, you can tell by looking at how much marble is on the outside of the collecting society. There's an inverse relationship, basically. Um, and all of those rights make it so hard to do something that we all agree should happen. Namely, there should be, okay, I want to listen to it legal legally. Click. Oh, well, 
well, this is France. Well, you need different rules here. This is the Netherlands. Oh, and there's 17 different rights you have to clear. We created that legal tangle, and it's taken people a long time to, to, to clear it. If I could just make one response on that, because I, I don't disagree uh, with that, but there's another side to the story. There is a policy dilemma any time a new technology emerges that touches on copyright. It is, if we act too soon, and Jamie described that, if we act too soon, we're going to make rules that are outstripped by the technology. And the, the negative effect of those rules will be to thwart the direction of technology. That's one side of the dilemma. The other side of the dilemma is, if we step back and wait, to see how the technology involves what patterns of consumer use evolve. By the time we get around to acting, the habit of free, unregulated use will become so entrenched that it becomes politically impossible to establish any property rule uh, at mm -hmm. all. I can tell you, we had, uh, I had worked on the, the case that involved home recording that went to the Supreme Court in the United States. And the driving force on, I was representing, I was working on behalf of the copyright owner, Motion Picture Studios, the driving force behind the litigation was we have to move this case along really fast because when the litigation started, there were probably no more than 40,000 home videotape machines in homes throughout the United States. By the time it got through the appellate process and up to the Supreme Court of the United States, there were millions of people making copies off the air. The Supreme Court, no less than the United States Congress, is not ready to pull the plug on millions of VCRs. That is a fundamental policy dilemma that Congress faces every time we have a new technology. I don't know what the answer is, but there are two sides to the dilemma. Here, here, here in Europe, we, uh, we've recently had some discussion about uh, uh, ancillary copyright. I'm not sure whether, whether you've heard about that, but that, that relates to snippets in uh, search engine uh, results. Uh, it's probably mostly directed towards Google News, basically, and lobbied by the news industry. Google called it a Google tax. Um, would something originating like this in the US be a good thing or a bad thing or the Germans have actually adopted a law governing it. So I, I care deeply about the future of journalism, particularly investigative journalism. I think actually in 10 years time, lots of things will be covered better than they are now. I'm sure that the quality of water in Amsterdam or the quality of the, the Amsterdam schools will be covered better than it is now because there are lots of smart environmentalists and parents who are very much vested in it and they're going to work really hard to make sure that information is there and it's going to go up and the cost of distribution is zero. That's going to be great. It's going to be better than it is now. What I'm more worried about is the correspondent in Iraq or the person who is, spends you know, six months working on one company's misdeeds. Uh, I don't know if a blogger can do that as well. So I support, the, I want to make sure we, we deal with the future of journalism. I think this is exactly the wrong way to go about it. Um, I actually, there is a proposal like this in the United States, uh, which would create something equivalent to a federal hot news uh, right, uh, right for a limited period of time over this. I, I think the, the trouble is it misattributes what the real cost, the real reason for the decline of newspapers is. It's not Google News. It's not aggregators. I mean, there's pretty good empirical data on this. It's that the average person spends 24 seconds reading a news story and does it at work. And it's a very hard to make money in 24 seconds at work, right? I mean, it just is very hard. Second, newspapers used to provide, get a lot of money out of providing real estate listings, finance advice, and so forth. We get that information better right now on the World Wide Web, right? It's better, right? The Yahoo Finance, Zillow, the real estate thing, they're better. And the newspapers have been outcompeted, which they should be. So there needs to be a future. We need to be innovative. I think universities have a role. I think foundations have a role. I think government support has a role. I think crowdsourcing, things like Kickstarter has a role. We need to help newspapers, but not through making fair use illegal. I would like to ask Bernd to, to come to the stage. Bernd Huguenholz. I think, is this, is it, yeah, this mic is also on. Bernd Huguenholz, as I said before, the director if you, if you prefer to uh, start with a few opening comments, that's fine, or join us immediately, what, whatever is comfortable to you. I'll go here. Bernd is the director of the Institute for Information Law. 
he's actually my boss for one day a week. Um, so, Bernd, we, 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 we've been talking about copyright law, uh, not really from a US perspective, uh, but uh, about the law in, in, in general. You've written a lot about the, uh, the perspective of uh, the creator, the, the author it's, itself, and whether he's still uh, protected under, under copyright law, and whether he is actually uh, granted re remuneration. Um, it's something that we, we, we haven't been hearing in the discussion so far. Um, how, how, how would you judge the developments in, uh, in, in actual author rights from a European perspective? I'll give you the, uh, the perspective of the creator supreme first, Sinterklaas. Um, the future of copyright does not look too bright. It may cause quite a fright between the left and the right. <laughs> the future of copyright is in a difficult plight. Will enforcement be tight or will fair use see the light? The future of copyright. Sinterklaas says, let's unite. Both Goldstein and Boyle are right. Everything will end up all right. Um, anyway, but that's not really what I came to say. Thank you. The, sorry, I'm still a bit in the mood. Um, in the mode. Okay, the rest will be non-rhyming. Um, yes, you are right that I'm very concerned about the author in, the, in this equation, and I feel, and that's of course the European perspective already mentioned by Paul and, uh, and also by Jamie, the Europeans traditionally, at least the continental Europeans, have this focus uh, more on the actual author than on the copyright industries or the users. We have that focus too, but we are traditionally, I think, a bit more concerned with, with real authors. And I think that's something that Europe can actually uh, add to the, um, to the debate, which is very American, even when it is conducted here in Europe. Um, my personal vision of the future, it's extremely difficult, of, of course, to predict anything, but I do believe we should focus perhaps a bit less on enforcement, a bit more on access, and I hear that in, in our previous speakers too, a bit less on exclusive rights and perhaps a bit more on remuneration. Remuneration not as necessarily only for the media companies that traditionally own the copyrights, but remuneration in particular for the actual creators, the authors who are I believe, and that is one of my main concerns, and that's what you're hinting at, uh, getting a really, really bad deal. Even, even in this brave new world where actually new licensing is taking place, a lot of this licensing is taking place without the actual authors having any influence on what's going on. And I don't see authors actually getting more money out of the internet, this fab fabulous uh, new technology, and I agree again with uh, the other speakers. I don't see them getting that extra, extra euro. So I think we should be more concerned with giving authors their right remuneration. Paul, well, you, 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 you mentioned the quality of works in, in respect to that, that there are too many works uh, created. Bernd is, 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 is stressing the fact that remuneration is, uh, is lacking. Who are you thinking of, where, by, by the way, when you're saying that the quality is going going down? Is this uh, Fifty Shades of Grey type of... It's, uh, it's me. It's Love Professors writing comic books. That's, that's what he's talking about. That's, no, actually, that's not what I had in mind. Well, you yeah, know, just listen to music, watch movies, and you'll see the quality going down. The... Yeah, I was having a conversation with a, uh, a friend who represents uh, some very prominent uh, musical uh, figures as well as uh, the estate of uh, some, some artists. And he's, very, he's an old school copyright guy and he said, well, you know, if we dealt with real property the way we deal with copyright, nobody in his right mind would be able to get financing to build a big skyscraper. And I said, that's absolutely right. And the same thing with copyright. What people will build on land with a copyright-like fair use, as the, the dimensions it's taken on under US law, they'll pitch tents. They won't build big buildings. What we see now is a situation in which people have an incentive perhaps to pitch a copyright tent, not much, uh, but to really devote a large chunk of your life to creating a work, 
Then to see it savaged by people who decide to mix it and mash it uh, without attribution to you, you know, violating the most fundamental moral rights, which are not honored in the United States, uh, or the situation in the United States respecting authors' moral rights has declined since the U.S. joined the Berne Convention, not grown. Those are the concerns that I have. I found, finally find a point on which we robustly disagree. Um, I share a sense of uh, disappointment about much contemporary culture. Um, I think the causal claim you make that the reason for the decline is increasing copyright limitations and exceptions uh, is one that it would take me a lot to swallow. Um, in fact, people put vast amounts of money um, into uh, cultural works right now. You could actually argue, and this is perverse, that not that these are, I agree, have artistry in them, but the Hollywood blockbuster with the $150 million, right, that is being created, right, we're actually increasing the average amount we're spending on films. Those films, by the way, are doing very well. One horrific thought is that one of the reasons that quality, in my view, is declining is that markets are becoming more efficient. We actually are getting people sending clearer signals. Uh, there's a publisher in, in, the, in the US, Andre Schifrin, who I uh, admired, greatly admired, who ran a fabulously contrarian um, book publishing arm. Um, he just passed away. Um, and th the reason was he was cross-supported by lots of other titles on the list. As the system became more relentlessly bottom line driven, those kinds of things are disappearing, and to be honest, I don't think copyright violation is the reason. Um, I'd also add this. Um, I see some hope where Paul sees, um, at least, if not despair, then, then reason for great concern. I think as we get better at having small groups of people connect directly with artists of any kind, writers, documentary filmmakers, reporters, musicians, we'll actually see an increase in quality, and here's why. When you have a mass medium distribution, you've got a TV uh, show, I might want to listen to Wagner, you know, um, uh, Burnt clearly would want to watch Mud Wrestling, um, you know, uh, uh, some, someone else might want to watch, you know, a, a, a really edgy science fiction film, but none of us, none of our views are powerful enough together, so what do we get? We get Friends and East Enders and, you know, The Good Wife, right? I mean, it's just a, you get the middle brow, lowest common denominator. When you have individual channels by which someone passionate about something can actually make a connection with an artist through a crowdsourcing thing like Kickstarter, through individual licensing, then you actually, for me, raise the possibility of that person who has that quirky vision and there are people out there who would intensely connect with it and will actually incentivize it. I think we're moving into a golden age rather than an age of decline, but we just have to go through a lot of Justin Bieber in the intermediary period. Baird? I'm not uh, entirely sure that uh, uh, quality is in decline, and if it is, I'm not so sure it's copyright's fault. And I, I don't think that's where we should really locate the crisis that copyright is currently in. It. And I think we all agree, and everyone agrees. That's an, one nice thing about the copyright debates we're having now. Everyone agrees that copyright is in a state of crisis. The only small difference is what is the solution. I, I think. The, the, the real crisis that we're having now is, is the crisis that was already touched upon by a few of our previous speakers, that, that the social legitimacy of the, of the model is in, in, in peril. If you ask, perhaps not a room full of copyright professors, but average people walking the lights of playing here, whether they believe in copyright, I don't think you will end up being very optimistic. There is a, a, an enormous gap between what people uh, what uh, the voters in the end, citizens, expect from the system and what they, what they are getting. And I think what we should focus on if we want to keep the system intact is, is create rules that more, that more closely approximate what people actually expect. And that doesn't mean that we should have the dumb masses rule, the rules of copyright, but we should try to, to, to close this gap. And I think one way of doing that is actually allowing a few more things that uh, um, we can't enforce any against anyway, uh, and 
in that uh, from that perspective, I'm not so sure we should we sh we should we should start prohibiting private use. I agree with Paul's economic analysis, but I don't think that is that socially or it makes a lot of sense now to 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 pr uh, prohibit private copying, which is something that a lot of consumers actually expect from this system. If we don't do that, the gap will only increase. And that, that's just an example. So I'm really worried about that. I'm worried about that one day copyright will just be voted out of the parliament. because uh, It will take a while. And the stakeholders are powerful, but uh, well, that, that's my serious concern. Stakeholders are not as powerful as they as they used to be, or as people on the other side continue to claim today that they are. By the way, the motion picture studios have consistently lost increasing amounts of money over the last five years. Uh, you're seeing 150 million dollar blockbusters, half of which goes to uh, promotion. Uh, they are dinosaurs. Uh, you're not going to see you know much much more of that. The films aren't particularly great, but that's not what I mean by quality. Uh, by quality, I mean all author's authorial autonomy, uh, which I do see broken down. Uh, but that's, you know, just to put a couple of things in, in perspective. So, now we have so, 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 so the, the, the dinosaur word has been mentioned. Um, many people actually say, many people in the streets in the lads supply that, that Bernd's talking about, is that copyright is actually protecting old industries, it's actually protecting the dinosaurs. Jamie, how would you comment to that? Um, well, first of all, I think, you know, people have legal rights and those rights deserve to be enforced. Um, those rights should be respected. Um, I think that p the mistake comes when someone says, I don't want you violating my property right and moves from that to, I want to uh, make it illegal for someone to compete with my business plan. Those are two different things. Paul mentioned the VCR. Um, that's one of the rare cases that the, the movie studios lost. And it was a wonderful thing for them to lose it, mm -hmm. because within a few years, more than 50% of their revenues were made up from people renting uh, movies at Blockbuster. They tried to get rid of a technology which would end up offering them a great market. Um, I think there's a message there. So I think dinosaur is the wrong way to, to look at it. I think a better way to look at it, and, and we we, we, dis we disagree on the empirics here, but my, my, what the studies I've seen show the, show the, the real revenues of music, movie companies is continuing to increase, but we, 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 can, we will debate this offline. Um, I think it's fascinating to look at what's actually happening and set aside our moral judgments, pro or anti strong copyright for the moment. Consider things like the music industry. So in the US at least, which is where I know the most about it, um, there's more revenue being generated from people making music professionally than ever before. It's a much larger industry. The record companies are capturing a much smaller share of that income. There are fewer, here's a thing that I find troubling, there are fewer session musicians earning $70,000 a year, but there are a lot more talented lawyers doing gigs at night and earning $5,000, $8,000 a year. The portion that comes from live performance is dramatically larger. The portion that comes from um, recorded music sales, both digital and analog, is, is falling. So that's the facts. What do we think about that? Right? I mean, that's just a difficult question, right? I mean, I worry about it. I worry about it because there are some people who are going to find it hard to succeed in this brave new world. If you are a singer songwriter, if you are, excuse me, a songwriter, a very good songwriter whose ugly as sin doesn't look good in a little black dress and can't sing a note, but is brilliant at penning tunes, I don't want you working as a waiter. And th the current system, where does that person make money in the current system? I worry about that. But it's not doom and gloom, it's a dramatically changed world with different forms of revenue stream activity and so forth coming up. It's not, and here I agree with Paul, it's not the death of music, it's a change in music. And I think the first thing we have to do is just study what's actually happening before we start you know, saying, oh, bad, bad, bad. Well, the, the, the question then is, uh, I mean, we, looking at copyright law as a reward for offers and a stimulus for offers, uh, not many authors have been able to actually make a living. If you look, for instance, to fiction, uh, Bernd, uh, we know that uh, there, there, there's probably a handful here in the lands that actually make a living. It is, uh, it is very, very difficult to be an independent uh, author living off uh, 
your work uh, without uh, all sorts of other uh, external subsidies like a, a job at a, a university, for instance. But, um, the, it is. Uh, it is deplorable, in fact, that situation. Uh, and here I want to uh, disagree, actually, with... I was instructed to disagree with everyone, and I'm very good at that. I want to disagree now with Jamie. Uh, he, he, with his, It's a popular thing, bashing collecting societies, and you did it very eloquently. Uh, and uh, particularly in America, you hear a lot of that, but also it's becoming a popular sport in Europe, too. Now, if you're looking at models that actually bring in money for authors, and you also want a model where enforcement is not the name of the game, where access, ma maximizing access is actually what you want, and where you also want to minimize transactional costs at the same time. And you don't want to abolish copyright. You almost inevitably come to this model. Collecting, collecting, uh, collective rights management is actually a very good model for the future. I'm ac actually convinced of that. Does that mean that all the collecting societies are good? No, they're not. Some of them are absolutely corrupt, and that's why it's very good that we have a, a, a new directive coming out of the European uh, Union recently, almost, re almost adopted now, which will uh, hopefully lead to more supervision and more transparency. But in principle, it's a very good system, I think. Paul? Yeah, I entirely agree about collecting uh, societies serving a, a very, very important function. There's you know, a great tradition of collectives, particularly in Europe, in continental Europe, that doesn't exist in the United States. We'll have three collecting societies for exactly the same right and no other collecting societies for all the other rights that, that may, may exist. But you know, having agreed there, I th there's a drift in the discussion that I find a little bit troubling. I think too much weight is being placed on the shoulders of copyright. When you ask the question, Christian, you know, is copyright there to uh, protect businesses against disruptions of their, of their business plans, when you, s you notice that very few authors, not only in the Netherlands, in the United States, very few authors, very few musicians, uh, many, many more fewer artists, actually can make a living from their writings. I don't think that there are there is more than a hundred or more than a hundred novelists in the United States who can support themselves on on their fiction. Uh, that's got nothing to do with copyright. Uh, that has to do with markets, what it takes to appeal to particular markets, and there is just a limit on people who are going to have bestsellers year in, year out. You know, copyright cannot correct that. What copyright is, and this is you know my opening point, is a very simple very elegant tool that has a very limited purpose, is to organize markets. Once you ask it to do more, once you ask it to be a distributional tool that moves money from here to there uh, on the base of distributional merit, that's not what it's about. And it will fail, and any time you ask it to do that, it's bound to fail. Let's, let, let, let's look into the future, uh, finally, uh, before asking the audience to, uh, to step in with, uh, with questions. Um, first question, of course, is are we in a state of crisis? And uh, Paul seems to answer that uh, profoundly differently than, uh, than Jamie and Bernd. Um, so maybe looking at the future, if you don't think we're in a quiet crisis, doesn't need any fixing. Uh, but if we are in a crisis, uh, how, how, how would we fix the current system? And let's start with Bernd and then go to Paul, uh, Jamie and Paul. Of course, it's part of my job to say that copyright is, is in a state of crisis. I mean, why wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't have nice events like this otherwise. Exactly. But um, um, I sincerely believe it is. And um, I think uh, uh, the way forward would indeed be to look back at what, why we have copyright in the first place? Well, we want to, I think the, the rationales I think we all agree on, we want to promote uh, creativity, uh, authorship, we want to promote access to cultural artifacts uh, without impeding uh, uh, cultural development and, uh, and, 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 and free speech, uh, roughly said. And we, If we want to do that, I think we, we should be looking at a, a, a copyright system that more closely uh, 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 brings that, and uh, as I already suggested, I think a, a gradual move from exclusive rights to remuneration rights is one way to do it. Uh, 
in addition to that, uh, more focus on instruments that actually bring the money that is being made in the market into the hands of the creators and not the media companies necessarily. I have a more detailed yeah. model, but I don't have time to discuss that. Jamie, um, five years from now? Is it in crisis? Yes and no. Um, no, in the sense that we have never had more people in the world collectively creating uh, cultural works, uh, writing things, taking pictures of things, sharing, engaging in their uh, artistic pursuits, and using the internet to do it. Uh, and I, mean, I don't just mean here, you know, things like Wikipedia. I mean, I find I know much more about other disciplines uh, in the academy now because while I, it's hard for me to go and read that book on demographics, um, there's now someone who does a wonderful blog, sort of showing the latest research on demographics. And I read that. It's written by an academic. It's really well written. Copyright doesn't play much of a role in that. He wants to share that material with the world, and he does so. But, you know, this is, we should be, this is something we lose sight of when we focus only on the, the downside and the illicit copying. Um, there is a huge rate of illicit copying. The, the content companies' um, estimates are that 25% of web traffic uh, consists of illicit copying. Um, we might quibble about whether it's 25% or 15% or 40%, but I mean, it's a, it's a very large number. I, I don't think that's um, a good thing. I want to fix it. Some of it I want to make legal. Some of it I want to change uh, distribution methods so that people actually would rather buy stuff. Um, so that, not necessarily. I would say the way that it's in crisis is that we don't realize, or we're not adequately realizing, that the copyright tail is wagging the technological dog, is the the the, we are in danger of making rules that seriously foreclose things down in the future. I think had the question, do we have the World Wide Web, yes or no, been clearly presented to governments in 1992, I think we would have said, no, we don't want it. It's dangerous. It will be full of spam and piracy and porn and strangely articulate, articulate sons of Nigerian oil ministers sending us um, wonderful offers. And we would have been right about all those things, but we wouldn't have foreseen the good things. What I worry about is copyright policy being made out in a, in a non-transparent way through secret international agreements in the absence of evidence. What I'd like is the kind of debate that we're having here where people actually get to see, look, you don't get to do it, you don't have to have everything. You want to download for free, but you also want to support artists? Well, guess what? You can't do that. You need to come up with some alternative scheme. But I'm uh, a boring Scottish empiricist. I believe that data is a wonderful corrective to the, the theories of all of us and not just, um, not just to those we disagree with. Well, no surprise, I don't think copyright is in serious crisis in the, in the commercial sphere. Uh, it gets in crisis when you begin to ask it to do things it's, it's not to, set to do. Uh, sure, copyright is not going to preserve the CD as against uh, individual downloads. It was not meant to do that. It was meant to ensure that you get paid when an individual song is downloaded. Some companies are going to lose market share, serious market share. That's not copyright's issue. And I wouldn't say copyright is in crisis when certain industries are going to disappear or attrite uh, as a result of this. Copyright, number one, is doing its work. That's number one. Uh, number two, copyright is not only about getting economic returns. Creative Commons, Jamie has shared, has been on their, uh, their board, is an absolutely wonderful institution that relies on copyright to ensure, if the author so desires, that works be used without a profit motive without compensation. So I want you to use it free, but I don't want you to make money from it either. And oh, by the way, and I'm sure you'll confirm this, the most popular box that's checked on Creative Commons by authors is, I do require that you attribute the work to me. Uh, so that's, you know, on that, the copyright is there for that reason. When Linus Torvalds created uh, Linux, uh, his first instinct was, Let's not have copyright on Linux. And for about a month, Linux did not have a copyright on it. And he quickly saw what was going to happen, is that people were going to take Linux, open source, and encroach it onto it, profit-making activities. He said, I need copyright on Linux in order to prohibit those kinds of uses being made. 
Last point on, I think, an overstated argument that I continue hearing that copyright stands in the way of innovation. I disagree with the, you know, the notion that copyright was going to shut down uh, the World Wide Web. Google made an extraordinarily bold decision several years ago when it said, we are going to recreate the library at Alexandria by digitizing all copyrighted, all works, whether in the public domain or protected uh, by, by copyright. I'm sure they had some legal advice. Their general counsel is a former student of, <laughs> of mine. Uh, and he and I have it's well trained, very well trained, but he missed a couple of classes. <laughs> um, but you know, there is one of our you know, Google is one of the major innovation companies in the United States that said, I don't know what went on internally, but effectively, let's do this because it's the right thing to do, and then let's see how the chips fall. And what happened was the initial resolution was a settlement agreement which was basically the parties, the Authors Guild, the publishers, and Google sitting down and creating a system for licensing and compensation, remuneration effectively, to authors for orphan works, the kind of works that Jamie is concerned about that I'm concerned about, that would have approximated what the United States Congress should have done if it weren't paralyzed on these kinds, these kinds of issues. Well, for a variety of technical reasons, the district judge didn't approve the settlement. They went back, they tried to renegotiate a settlement, they couldn't meet his approval. The upshot of it is a decision by the same district judge just last month that said what Google is doing on Google Books with copyrighted works is a fair use. Uh, a decision that manifestly, as applied to foreign works, to Dutch works, violates the Berne Convention, violates the TRIPS agreement. But those prospects didn't stand either in Google's way in taking this extraordinarily bold and brave approach, nor did it stand in the way of this district court judge, nor, I'm confident, is it going to stand in the way of the appellate court that gets the ultimate appeal in that case, which has two fair use activists sitting on the panel that will hear any appeal. Heal. And you say, well, wow, you know, there is some innovation that didn't get stultified by copyright. Pretty impressive. 